What's going on? My name is Will, and I have the honor and the privilege as serving as one of the leaders here at Transformation Church. I just wanna say thank you so much for tuning in from wherever you are watching from. And if you haven't already, be sure to like and subscribe. We believe that God has such an incredible word for you today. So let's jump into this amazing message. Welcome to week five of a series that we're in called Damage But Not Destroy. Ain't that? Yeah. Um, this series has started healing all over the world. And if you have not um, walked with us through the last four messages, I'm, I'm asking you, I'm begging you, I'm pleading with you. Go back on YouTube this week and watch all of them. Just have them going in your house. Just go to sleep to it. Instead of the Netflix, just put on YouTube and put on Damage But Not Destroy. Just, just allow this to begin to permeate in you because I believe that God is starting to allow his people to deal with damage. Our shout next year is not going to be a shout that is restrained because of what we have not dealt with. When the Bible says, um, um, deal with all your weights and the sin, a lot of the issues of our trauma and our drama are weights that God's saying, it ain't a sin no more, but it's weighing you down. And um, we have committed to a season of healing. Look at your neighbor and say, it's healing season. I know when it starts getting warm outside, everybody think it's cuffing season and you're ready to have a bay and you're ready to get warm and cuddle next to somebody. Before you get a bay, you need healing. I'm going to say it one more time. Before you do your third marriage, let's go to therapy. <laughs> it's called insanity to do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. And I just believe it's time for the body of Christ to heal. Somebody say, it's healing season. And um, today I have a burden, not just a message. I have a burden that came to me and I was really trying to fight it off because I've never done this before. I've never um, known I have to talk directly, firmly, and strongly to a group of people that are listening to this message right now in such a way that I, I, I told them I can't stand up. I need to sit down, put me something next to, like do something different because this is different what I'm doing. I, I know today that I have to specifically talk to men. Now I know this church is filled with 85% of women. God bless you. But may I submit to you that the problem with our society is not on your shoulders. May, I, I know I'm not gonna get a lot of claps for this, but may I submit to you that the reason the enemy has been able to run crazy in our society and our families, on our kids, is because men have gotten out of place. And we had a whole hot girl summer this summer. We had a whole, all the speakers was women, everything. We need a hot men sermon. Today, I'm going to be humble, open, and transparent with men. And, and ladies, I need you to know this may be the most important message you ever hear. Because everybody is affected by the men in their lives. Or the lack of men in their lives. This message is gonna teach women how to pray for their men. Not just abuse them and bash them and tell them what they don't do. It's gonna teach them how to pray with specificity and accuracy and intentionality for the men of God that you have in your life or you may be raising. Today, I want to give you a vision, ladies, for the type of men that you want to lead you. I, <laughs> let me say it like this. It's less important where your man takes you on your first date and more important that he understands his God-given mandate. I don't know if y'all were in the dark like me, but this, 
This past week, I had the opportunity to, to go put Christ in the middle of culture, and uh, your pastor was on the Breakfast Club on, uh, on this past Tuesday. And while I was up there talking about damage but not destroyed and, and sharing the love of Christ, they brought up this list. <laughs> he said, tell them about the list, pastor. But there was this list of that, that a, a, a conglomerate of women got together and made about um, the, the, the places that you cannot take them on their first date. And it was a very extensive list. It was exhaustive. I mean, it was... There's like 27, 30 things, like, and I mean, I mean, they started off strong. They was like, you can't take me to Cheesecake Factory. I said, that is not cheap. <laughs> that bread is the only free thing at Cheesecake Factory. Y'all know the brown bread? And as I begin to see how this cultural phenomenon took over people's ideas, I was like, they're focused on the wrong thing. It's not a relationship goal series, but I just, I was like, it's less important where your man takes you on a first date. And it's more important that he has a vision from God about the mandate of why he is here. And um, I came to the conclusion, you only make lists when somebody doesn't know how to lead. The only reason you need to make a list it's because somebody's not walking in their dominion and leading where people need to go. And the truth of the matter is the only reason that list could exist is because there has been an epidemic of passive men that has flourished in the body of Christ and in the world. The women of God and the women period are looking to be led. Ladies, y'all should have amen more than that. And some of y'all like, I'm not looking to be led. I'm on my own. Uh -huh, calm down. The only reason you take somebody's place is because they're out of it. And I just feel like I got I to gotta sit here and look at you and, and let you know that today... The men of God need to deal with our damage first. Most of us are hoping our women get it together so then it kind of rubs off on us. If she would just get it together and God is coming to your house today and saying that I commanded and mandated the man to do everything in the household first. Woman was taken out of man's rib. The man was already here and God said, it's not good for him to be alone. Not, it's not good for him not to lead. But since the very beginning, instead of taking responsibility, we place blame. Oh, y'all don't remember? Adam, why did y'all eat the food? Do you remember Eve ate the fruit, God talked to Adam. Go read it. He didn't address them as equals. He spoke to the one he gave leadership to. And what did he do? It's the woman you gave me. He shifted blame when he should have repented. I cannot believe that the God who after man is separated from him makes us come back to him through repentance would not have saved all that time if Adam would have said it was me. My bad, God. I didn't give her full instructions of what you said. And even when she offered me the fruit, I love her so much, but I knew what you said, but I, I was weak in that moment. I turn. I repent. And since Adam, we've been shifting blame. But the damage that happened to you may have not been your fault, but it is now your responsibility. And um, today I want to I entitle the message, 
when men mend. When men mend. Say it with me. When men mend. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom. It's the only thing he preached. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And he, as he was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. For they were fishermen. Then Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little further from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who was also in the boat, mending their nets when men mend. And immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired servants and went after him. God, teach every man that it is your desire for us to mend. In Jesus' name, amen. Ooh, I'm about to work this. The first four men that Jesus calls to be a disciple were fishermen. That could be also said they were men who knew how to mend. Because you cannot be a fisherman and throw your net out there day after day and there not be a tear, rip, breach in your net. So these men that Jesus walks up, he could have chose anybody. But what he chose to be disciples of him, followers of him, is mend who mend. Mending men. Men who actually use their hands to build up and not tear down. Men who don't just use things, they know how to put them back together. That phrase, mending their nets, was used in Mark chapter 1, verse 19, and Matthew 4, 21. But it comes from the same Greek word, okay? Watch this. Katartizo. How do you spell that? K-A-T-A-R-T-I-D-Z-O. Katartizo. I practiced that for a long time. But look at the meaning. It means to repair, mend, watch this one, prepare or restore. This Greek word that means mending their nets, it means that the men that God chose in the very beginning were men that knew how to fix things after damage. Were men that knew how to prepare, fortify things before damage. And men who knew how to restore, bring back to original form. Is that how you would describe the men in your life? She said, no. <laughs> and this is not a message to bring anybody down. This is a message to set the bar. This is a message to bring everybody up to understand that until men of God get into their right place and mend the nets, mend the relationships, mend the breaches, mend the brokenness. We will always have things that slip through what should have been caught by us. We have children slipping through our nets. We have resources slipping through our nets. We have confidence slipping through our nets. We may live in the most insecure men generation ever. You look at men, they're not confident in anything they do. What do you do? You know, well, I'm really between. No, 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 what? Say it with your chest. You may clean up. I am a bathroom technician. <laughs> Say it with something in you. It's not where I'm going to be forever, but this is where I am right now, and I'm not ashamed of the process. Okay. 
Please do not let social media and people's opinion make you ashamed of the process God has you in. David's first time to the palace was as a servant. He was Spotify for King Saul. I want you to think, play this tune. All he did, that was his first time to the palace, but the place he would rule in was the place he had to serve first. And we have so many people ashamed of the process God has them in. And because of that, we have not been taught to mend nets. Now, when I started to research this, mending the nets was something that was passed down from generation to generation. That means if your father was not there, you did not learn how to mend nets properly. And the truth of the matter is we live in the most fatherless generation in history where men can sow their seed but not raise the tree. And then they're ashamed of the fruit it produces. But the problem is we will not learn this skill, this very intricate. You, you can't mend without intimacy. You, you, you have to put your hands on something. You have to be gentle with it. You have, to, you have to be delicate to mend. And men have been demasculated and taught that being delicate is weak. Be, being careful with our word choice. You have shut the hell up, hope. Oh, y'all already know you told your kids that yesterday. You, you, you feel like because you're an adult, you're the man. I shouldn't have to explain myself to you. No, no, no. They may need to learn how when they're frustrated, they can mend a relationship without going off on somebody. But you didn't see it, so you can't teach it. But this word, mending nets, means to everybody say repair, fix after damage. Everybody say prepare. That's fortify before damage and then restore. Bring back to original form. When I, when I started to look at the men that Jesus chose to carry the gospel, like think about this. He only chose a few men and all the men he chose in the beginning were menders. Which tells me a common practice for men before the modern era, era of technology was mending. There was no geek squad. There was no tech support or net support. There was no place you could go take your net. It was a common practice for men to know how to put things back together. Not just use things, not just break things, not just make things, but mend things. I believe with all my heart that Jesus desires men to mend again. By faith, somebody needs to agree with me right there. It's time for us to mend again. Maybe you've never seen it. Maybe you've not been a part of it. Maybe it's going to take a lot of work for you to actually come off of the pride that you've built up to not do it. But the first person to say sorry in your household should be the man of God. <laughs> the first person to say sorry, the first person to go, the first person to open a Bible. And the whole church as a body of Christ right now is very feminine. Oh, God. We got more men that know lyrics to rap songs that degrade the relationship that they want to have than scriptures hidden in their hearts. How does a young man, a young woman keep their way pure? By hiding the word of God in their heart. You got Drake songs in your heart. And now you've made babies that you don't have anything to pass on except the damage. So what's not transformed is transfer. I'm looking you dead in your face. It is real quiet in here, Mama Chloe. 
Because the truth of the matter is, you have, you have learned that correction is threatening. Instead of correction being for your benefit. LeBron James has a coach. Michael Jordan had a coach. Tiger Woods had a coach. The greatest to do things at their level paid people to correct them. And because we feel like everybody's trying to come at me. Can't nobody judge me except God. Thug life. Because of this warped mentality that has crept into the church, we think correction means separation from people. Except the Bible says God chastens or corrects the ones that he loves. So three areas that I believe that men need to become professionals at mending again. Number one, we need to mend the relationship between us and him. How did prayer get out of school? Because men didn't stand up. <laughs> how, how, there's so many real things coming to my head right now, Carl. I don't know if I can say all of them. We might need to have like a closed men's meeting. Why do these young ladies dress in a way that is provocative and suggestive under the age of 16? It's because the men in their life did not affirm them and give them value beyond their curves. And so to get the affirmation you should have gave them, they have to do things or feel like they have to do things to go to get the attention that the man in their life was supposed to give them. And because in some people's cases, the men in their life were so perverted that they violated them. Their mind now is warped to what a father, a man, even the baritone in your voice was supposed to mean. So now they're going to take control into their own hands. And that's where this whole sexuality movement comes. I control my own body. Most people, they were violated. And so instead of being submitted to what the word of God or father God says, they have to take control because the earthly men in their life did not mend. So the first relationship that needs to be mended is our relationship between us and him. Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read a, a thick piece of scripture right here. And I want you to see how God made a plan for us to be mended back to him after we were separated in the garden. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. In which you used to live. When you followed the ways of the world and under the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. That is a lot of Bible right there. You serve the devil if you don't serve God. That's what that first part of scripture said. I just want everybody to know that if you don't get in the kingdom of God, you are serving under the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work. In those who are disobedient to God. We'll leave that right there. Verse 3. All of us also lived among them at one time. So everybody that got real churchy and real religious, you was there too. He said, we used to gratify the cravings of our flesh. And following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature, by nature... By this fallen nature, deserving of the wrath. But, everybody say but. Woo! But because of his great love for us. God. I, I love this because it is not religion. There's no church there. 
There's no organization. But because of his great love for us, who are you talking about? God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions. What this says is when you were going after God, going away from God, God was coming after you. While you were dead in your transgression, he was like, but they're going to turn around. But they're going to they're gonna find out that there's a better way. And he said, it is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in, coming, in the coming age, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. What God is wanting to do in this age and in the next is see, see how jacked up they were? Look how much grace I put on them. And now look at him. He wants to show off his grace by how messed up we were, being mixed with how good he is, and us still getting to the finished product we don't even deserve. Oh, I love God. For it is, verse 8, by grace that you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. There's no class you took to deserve this. There's no good deeds you did. I know you think you're a good person, but there was only one of those. His name was Jesus. This is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's, watch this, handiwork. We are the thing that God decides to put his hands on as the man of man. The man of men, the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He said, with all my power, I want to be in the details. I want my hand to be on. Do y'all remember how we were created? He put his hand in the dirt. He put his hand on us. Everything else he spoke to. Let there be light. He never touched the sun. Stars. Earth, the first time he touches the earth was to make us. Why did he want to put his hand on us? Because he wanted to be in the details of knitting us together so it would be handcrafted, handmade, his handiwork, his design. We are his master. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. This makes me think about Psalms 139. For you were created, for you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Real men mend. They mend their relationship between themselves and God. If you want to be a real man, get your stuff right with God. Stop blaming everybody else. Stop telling everybody why you can't. If somebody would just see, no, 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 no. If God be for you. Who could be, did y'all just see Will Heckenbach up here? I was in the back when he was giving his testimony. He was in prison. Now he's ministering in prisons. Y'all don't know. Y'all don't know when to shout. He, he, he gave y'all an insight. He said he went back into the prison and it shocked him because he was able to go and come as he pleased. Do you know how many days he probably looked at those metal bars and said, I wish I could get out of here. But while he was in jail, God was mending him back together, y'all. And I, I believe that many of the trials that men go through are an opportunity to, for you to see that you cannot do it on your own. Your failure is a path to faith. I believe sometimes God intentionally allows you to fall flat on your face so you can see you're not God. <sighs> So that you can, and you still, after all the times he preserved you, 
after all the times that you should have died because of alcohol poisoning, after all the babies you have with all of these women and none of them have killed you yet? <laughs> That's a real situation. After God, after that record being what it was and God allowing you to find the one employer who would look beyond your faults and see your need. After him picking your business back up after three failed attempts, you still going to sit in the place of Lord and King? The first relationship that every man needs to mend is your relationship with him. And if you're in this room before the end of this service, you're going to have a, a chance to walk out of here mended back to your heavenly father. Okay. All men need to mend their relationship with God. Number two. Every man needs to mend the relationship between us and them. We need to mend the relationships between us and other people. Now, this one is the hard one. Because what keeps men from mending relationships is pride. And some of y'all have not mended relationships with your spouse, with your children, with old relationships, with business partners because of your pride. And I just want to let you know it might be costing you more than you think it is. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 25. So stop telling lies. How you doing, bro? I'm good. No, I'm good. I, don't, I just don't F with them. I'm, no, 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 no. I'm good. Just, hey, he stay over there. I stay over here. If he come back, it's on site. Y'all know what I'm talking about. On site. Like, that means no. Somebody's like, on site, Sally. I don't understand. Is that, are they in the same vicinity? Okay, let me help you, Sally. If, if somebody says it's on site, that means when they get together, we'll, there won't be any talking. Oh my God, that's very, 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 very aggressive. Yes. <laughs> On site is very aggressive. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, Ephesians says, stop telling lies. You're not good. You're hurt. You're angry. You're frustrated. You feel disrespected. There should be more amens in here from men. But the problem is you haven't even been even conditioned or given permission to feel. So when you, when you actually want to say something, you shut up. Can I? Mm. Still, I'm doing a whole message on men and all I hear is the ladies. Yes. <laughs> say that. Okay. Like the men, what they doing? You might not be doing it physically, but we're doing it emotionally. You've been protecting yourself since seven. And what I'm telling you is pride may have served you in a season to survive. But it's no longer serving you. If you are going to be the type of man that God has called us to be, and we're going to be the ones to deal with our damage first, you have to kill pride in your life. So stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. This is what the scripture says. Not God. He already know it. No, God know my heart. Yes, but your brother doesn't. I don't know. I already talked to God about it. Now you need to talk to your wife. He'll give you the words to say. He'll give you the desire and, and the power to do what pleases him. But many times we're not doing what we need to do because we think it stops with God. But healing always happens person to person. That's why James tells us to confess our sins one to another. Pray for each other, and that's when healing actually comes. So most, most of us, especially as men, we've confessed it to God, but we still haven't experienced healing because we have not confessed it to anybody else. 
says, this is why many of us need therapy. This is why all of us need community. You need a small group that you can walk in and say, my wife on my last nerve, bro. I mean, the smell of the wig is getting on my nerves. I'm talking about, I'm talking about she leaned over to kiss me and I was like, ew. You can't say that to her. But <laughs> she said, better not. You, you, because the truth of the matter, there's some emotions in there. There's some frustrations in there. But who can you say? Who, how can you get it out of you? And until you let pride die, you can't do it. Let me finish reading this scripture. Stop lying. Let us tell our neighbors the truth. For we are all parts of the same body. And don't sin by letting anger control you. Did I just describe most men? We know one emotion. It's the one we go to faster than any other one. It really is a cover-up for what we're really feeling. When we feel rejected, we're angry. When we feel disrespected, we're angry. It's the easy one to go to. And we have torn our children and our wives and our brothers down with the one emotion of anger. And the Bible's addressing it right here. Don't sin by letting anger control you. It doesn't mean you can't have it, but if it's controlling you, if it makes you do something after it that doesn't go to God, if it makes you damage something or somebody, some of y'all got more holes in your wall. Pictures just... It's like, what were you guys going through? Okay, I see the abstract that you were going for in the decor. Like, the truth of the matter is it's just patches over places. And then you justify it by saying at least it wasn't their face. Hold on, wait, what? Don't let the sun go down while you are still angry. Everybody that says that scripture is like, because we need unity. So do not let husbands, wives, don't let the sun go down on your anger because God blesses unity. Yes, he does. But if you read the rest of the scripture, it tells you why you don't want to go to bed angry. And most people miss this part. For anger gives a foothold to the devil. When you don't mend, you lose. You, oh, let me say it like this. When you don't mend, you leave room for the devil to come in. Some of y'all, why, why I just got this, oh, I just got these urges right now. Who you angry at? I know I'm about to do something dumb, bro. I know I'm about to do something dumb. She got one more time to say something to me, and I promise you I'm up. Who you really angry at? Nothing's happening for me. Man, I've been working this whack job, delivering these whack packages to all these whack people. I got this great idea. Why won't God let this off the ground? Who are you angry at? Because when you're angry, you open the door. It's a foothold. You know when a door is closing and then somebody says, eh? See, see, see there's, there, there's something about having access when, you, when you're in, in, in doors that have something precious behind them. The only place where somebody unauthorized can get in is when you're not watching when the door is closing. So many times you, you, you in your heart, because that's why the Bible says guard your heart above all else, because out of that place flows the issues of life. And, and, and because anger is in there, it's like the devil just putting his foot in the door. He ain't even got to come in right now. He just got access. Yeah, I'm going to wait till about 1.30 after Love and Hip Hop goes off. And you still angry, huh? Your wife's sitting right next to you. But I'm going to allow you to get on social media and go into vanish mode. Some of y'all, vanish mode? It is, it is a mode on Instagram where it deletes the messages in the DMs immediately. She says, shut up! 
I thought that was something to do with the Holy Spirit. I don't know. So, so somebody that DMs you six weeks ago and you've been saving that DM, you just open it up to look for the hope. And you just text them something like, what you been up to? Stressed, trying to figure out how to relieve some pain. Uh, what? Scripture, 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 uh, scripture. I can help you with that. Oh, I should, uh, why did I text it? You playing boy. I'm a grown man, but she called me boy. That felt good. I'm telling you what really happens. I'm just going to go to sleep. I'm going to just go to sleep. I'm going to just go to sleep. I'm going to go to sleep. Six days later, you stopped it. You, you, you ghosted them. Done. But did you deal with that anger? Because if you didn't deal with it, he still got his foot. The enemy's smart. The Bible says he, he goes around like a roaring lion seeking whom? Whom he might devour. And many times we're leaving the door open to the enemy because we have not dealt with the damage the anger, the isolation, the hurt that's on the inside of us. God's idea of men does not work with culture's idea of man. Man up. Tough it out. Shut up before I give you something to cry about. Stop being a punk. Your son is hurting. You're teaching him at five years old to ignore his emotions. Stop being a little punk. Your sister could have took that. You just a sissy. His father's not in the home and you're giving him identity that goes against the word of a God. Jesus experienced every emotion. Jesus was allowed to feel that but you won't let your son feel it because of the embarrassment it might cause you because of the deficiencies you haven't dealt with. No, 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 I'm just saying, like, you can't raise no punk. Okay. So when, it, when, he, when he stops feeling and it turns into anger and rage, I don't know what to do with him. I just can't control him. You trained him. You, you, this, every child is programmed. That's why the Bible says train a child in the way they should go. So when they get older, they won't depart from it. The problem is we're getting the generation we're getting right now because we trained them that way. Stop blaming school and the church because your children's pastor is you. We made up children's pastor in church to make you feel good about your kids going to the place right now. But children's pastor is not in the Bible. The only children's pastor is the parents. Your kids are a product of your parenting. I know, I know. And men... You can't parent without proximity. Oh my God, I'm walking too heavy right now. I know y'all don't want church people to say this. You want me to tell you, your breakthrough's on the way. Doesn't matter if you get money if you don't have a relationship with the seed you brought into this earth. It doesn't matter. And you've stopped trying because of the baby mama. You slept with her. That child had nothing to do. And now you've given up because she's difficult? You were cheating on her. 
Okay, let me stop. You act like you was not creeping with her friends. You did it. And now you're mad because she feels rejected again? Because the man who was supposed to give her identity in the beginning wasn't there. So the first time she was supposed, the first two times she was supposed to experience love, she ran into a father that was absent and a man who had not been taught to mend. And yes, she is bitter and broken and mad and pissed. And if you give her an opportunity, she's going to slap you. No, you need to deal with your issue. Deal with your issue. Deal with your issue, ma'am. What, what, what I'm saying is just because it's not working, you don't get to stop trying. There's too much at stake. The only reason you go after mending a relationship is because there may be use for it again. These disciples weren't mending the nets to then throw them away. They were mending the nets in preparation for what was to come next. I keep telling young leaders all the time, you better value the relationships you're around. Even when you leave companies and exit stuff, be careful how you leave places and what you say, because this world is a widow. And the very person you think you're escaping from, God has a way of two or three years later. That being the very person you need. <sighs> this is why you always treat people with kindness and you always, uh, uh, okay, you always mend. He said, teach me how, coach. I'm glad that you ask. Okay. Meekness. Meekness is how. How do I mend my relationship with God? I come under submission. Meekness is not weakness. I want the number one quality on every woman's list to be meekness. Why? It's who Jesus was. Power under control. I mean, he's on the cross and literally tells us it's the most gangster thing. I could call 10,000 angels to get me right now, but I'm choosing to submit to the will of my father. You better be glad I'm meek because I could tear this mug up. I could tear the club up. When's the last time you could, but you didn't? When, when's the last time you know Shorty would have gave it up and you deleted the whole contact? <laughs> it's the truth anyhow. When the last time that you could have made a decision to financially change the trajectory of your family's life? And you say, you know what? I'm going to ask God if I'm supposed to do this first. I'm going to submit my will to his will. No, it's a great opportunity. Is it an assignment from God? Or is it something else to take you away from the family? Okay. Last thing. We need to mend our relationship, number one, with us and him. Then we need to, number two, mend our relationship with us and them. And then the last relationship we need to mend as men is we need to mend the relationship between him and them. Every man is supposed to help other men repair their relationship between God and others. We don't do this at all. All we worried about, I'm right with God, and I'm right with my foe and no more. But what did he tell the disciples? I'm going to make you fishers of men. You're supposed to be the lead disciple maker in your house. Where's the church? Does the church have discipleship? Yes, you.
Because this takes the responsibility off of everybody else. What scriptures can you give your sons? What scriptures come out of your heart? When you're ready to fight somebody, cuss somebody out, make a move, what things come out of you? You're the lead discipler of your household, even if you don't have a family yet. Your decisions today create your patterns of tomorrow. And if you would decide to be a disciple today, when your children come in to the world, you then have the ability to love them, raise them, and give them out of your overflow. Galatians 6.1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in sin, you who live by the Spirit should, uh uh-oh, here's that Greek word again. The word is restore in the Bible, but if you search it back to the Greek, it's katartizo. Brothers and sisters, if you live in the Spirit, you should mend, repair, prepare, and restore people gently. But watch yourself, because the way you restore them, you still have the opportunity to be tempted. The reason I'm up here and I'm sharing my story and I wrote Damaged But Not Destroyed and I'm telling all my business every week Every week I'm telling my business. I went on the breakfast club this week and told my business. I, I mean, I'm, I'm in the middle of like gossip news, culture, every, and uh, I was a man obsessed with greatness and God told me that my standard could not be higher than his. If he said it was good, why do I want it to be great? I need to go to therapy. I was molested at six years old. I forgot about it and blocked it out until I was 31. I was already a pastor. I had to tell my wife what happened to me, and we had to go through counseling together. God, why am I doing this? Oh, because there's another man out there that has never seen a man actually help mend them. You've never told anybody what actually happened. You never mentioned what you actually saw. You never told anybody you saw that person leaving the house. You never told your parents what happened to you at school because you knew if they knew, they would have hurt that person. And because you actually have a heart of compassion, you didn't want the person who hurt you to be hurt. So you protected them by hurting yourself. What are you asking us to do, Pastor? Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name, I want to focus on two words, will humble themselves. Everything that comes after that, everybody maximizes on the next parts. That they would pray and seek my face. You can't do that without humility. What are you saying, Pastor Mike? I'm asking every man, man in this place to become men who mend. How do we do that? We stop walking in pride and we humble ourselves. What's the point of this message, Pastor Mike? Humble yourself. You've only heard Kendrick Lamar say it and you still don't know how to do it. Humble, because there's only two ways of humility. You humble yourself or you be humbled. And many men, the saddest truth is many men do not humble themselves until they are forced to. You lost everything. Now God, I'm coming to you. Have y'all seen that every person that's like a a R&B or rap star, when they get 59, they give their life to Christ. <laughs> like at the, the lowest point of their influence. And I'm grateful that they do that, but how many other people could they have helped? 
if they became a fisher of men and mended the nets while they were on that platform. James 4.10, humble yourself before the Lord. Another translation says, under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up in honor. How do I humble myself? One point, this is how we going home. Acknowledge God. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Because I wanted something every man could go home and every woman. You're a man with a womb. So this whole message applies to you, but I needed to be very specific to the men of God. But this is for everybody. Everything I said, go back and apply it to yourself. How do we walk in this? Acknowledge God in everything. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And this is going to help men. Don't lean to your own understanding. It ain't that good. I mean, I know I be not thinking stuff just between me, my wife, and my kids. So thinking about my whole life, God said, don't even worry, bro. You, your understanding, you don't even have to be good. In all your ways, do this one thing. Acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. Before you look at your budget, God, I wasn't trained on how to do money right. So today I'm acknowledging I need you to help me be a good steward over the finances you gave me. That's humbling yourself and acknowledging him. That mends what the enemy has tried to break. Before you leave your house and go to work, acknowledge God, people piss me off. Oh, y'all want fake prayers. Father, people be tap dancing on my last nerve, especially at this job I'm at right now. So, God, I'm acknowledging that you can give me both the power and desire to do what pleases you. You call me to be a light in the midst of darkness. So, God, I'm acknowledging that it will be your grace and your peace that I make it through this day without going off on somebody. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you give that message to the youth that you're trying to help them, before you do what you think you know how to do, acknowledge, God, I am just a man. And my words fall to the ground. But if you would allow your spirit to be on the words that I say, it could go into somebody's life, Father God, and change them forever. Acknowledge him before you get in that bedroom and bless the union that God has given you. God, I acknowledge that you are the creator of this body. Lord, let me do some things that she ain't never seen before. <laughs> Play if you want to, but he's a good God. Um, it says acknowledge him in. He will direct your path. Before you buy that dream house. And you got the money to do it. He says, it might be monetarily the thing to do, but the more square footage is going to make your family move apart. You can't see it now, but three years down the road, you're going to be in your man cave, and she's going to be in her she shed, and your kids are going to be in the game room, and some boy's going to be sneaking out the back. Somebody said, no, he's not. He already has. <laughs> it's crazy what you find out years later. What, what, what are you saying, Pastor Mike? Maybe it's not that you can't get the bigger house. Maybe you're not supposed to. But how would you know if you don't acknowledge him in all your ways so he can direct your path before you put that child up for adoption? before you take them to Planned Parenthood. And I understand there's real reasons for all kinds of stuff. All I'm saying is, could you acknowledge God in all your ways so that he, before you pick the college you're going to, don't go there because your friends go there. Go there because he's assigning you. What if you at the wrong college and your wife at the other one? And you went there for dudes you will not be friends with six years from now. 
in all your ways. Acknowledge him. Before you play the biggest game of your career, acknowledge him. Can you bring me that net real quick? I just want everybody to see this. Um, mending, I never thought of it as manly until I understood that this is the type of people that Jesus picked. He picked people who would take nets and they would throw them out. And then if something came to cut pieces of the net, to destroy pieces of the net, to break the ties of the net, these men would have to be still enough to see where the breach was. And it's not that many of us don't know how, many of us are too busy to even pay attention. It's when it's disconnected and it doesn't look big now. But the truth of the matter is, is one weak place leads to another weak place, leads to another weak place. And we're growing up generationally with holes. What we were meant to catch, a whole person could slip through. How many people have slipped through your net? How many relationships have slipped through your net? How many conversations could change the trajectory of every holiday y'all ever have from here on out? Stop lying. Tell the truth. Because people are slipping through the net of your life. Mending men. I prophesy that this message is going to start a revolution of men that take their space, that do not lead from the back, but we will lead from the front. We will be the prayer warriors in our home. We will be the men who set things in order, not with a strong arm and a hard voice, but with tender compassion and love. We will be the men that men, I feel the power of God. We will speak life into our daughters and speak virtue into our sons. We will esteem our wives and our women and our sisters. We will be men of valor, men of war. Don't you come in my house, devil. Ugh. We won't passively sit by. We will wage war on the enemy. I believe that there is a season in this church coming. There will be more men serving. Oh, y'all didn't miss it. More men saying, no, 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 no. They may not have a father, but they will have a father figure. I'm going to go serve in the children's. I'm going to be in the parking lot. I'm on the security team. I'm worshiping. I wish that all, all men would lift up holy hands. In worship, I'm undignified. You was out there going crazy. I, I can't control myself when I start talking about the father who loves me. We will be men that cry. We will be men that apologize. We will be men who take responsibility. We'll be men who let our yes be yes and our no be no. We will be mending men. Well, every man stand in this place. I feel like this is the beginning of a new era. There will be men that deal with their damage. Everybody say first. Don't let your wife be the first one to sign up for counseling. She's been begging you to go talk. I ain't gonna talk nobody. I don't know me. Nobody knows you. You don't even know you. Why do you feel the way you feel? You don't know. 
It was old white ladies that helped me. I say that because I want to break every stereotype. How she know what a black man? She don't. But everybody knows what emotions are. And everybody knows what it is to be oppressed and suppressed at some level. It was older white women that helped this big braided black man. I just want to let you know that there's no right way to do this. This is about progression, not perfection. Maybe y'all do need to go to family counseling. Maybe for Christmas this year, everybody gets counseling. <laughs> y'all playing. But them Jordans not making nothing better. Them iPhones have not changed anything. It's just taking you further apart. They got an Xbox and they gonna X you out of their lives. But what would happen if we became mending men? Sons, you may have to go and start the conversation with your father. He wasn't given the tools. He doesn't even know how to say I'm sorry. But you could become what he wasn't. You could be a mending man. He could look at you like, I want to be like him when I grow up. I want to tell you a story where I felt very inadequate. I'm going to be very vulnerable right here. Um, me and my wife went to an award show um, in Las Vegas earlier this year. And we bought this beautiful uh, fuchsia dress. She got our hair done, makeup done. We're headed to the award show, and my wife asked me to help her zip up this dress. The dress is expensive. It's been tailored. It looks perfect. And in my uh, newfound strength, I, I went to, to um, pull it up, and the zipper broke. Now, it wasn't one of the, like, regular zipper breaks. It was one where it start coming apart in the middle. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like you zip it and then some of it zipped up and then you thought it all zipped up and then in the middle start going. So it's zipped up in the back and it's zipped up at the bottom, but the middle has all her undergarments, everything exposed. It's 10 minutes before we're supposed to be on the red carpet. I prayed. I spoke to it. I fasted. I did everything in that moment. No, laid hands on it. There was nothing I could do. And Natalie said, I'm just going to go back to the hotel. I was like, first off, I don't even look good without you on the red carpet. I'm not going to this award show without you. This is the whole reason we came. I was like, all right, we're going back to the hotel. And the Holy Spirit told me to go out to the car. And I went out to the car and Charles was in the car. Now I had to let my pride go at this moment because I messed it up. It was my trying to fix it that broke it. But I had no tools to fix it. And I was with Scott, Charles, and Cordell. And I go to the car and I look around and I was like, who can help me? Scott cannot help me in this situation. <laughs> I looked at Cordell, I was like, Cordell does not have what I need. And I looked at Charles and I said, Charles, bro, do you know how to sew? And I was expecting a like, nah, bro. <laughs> and he said, my granny Estelle taught me how to sew. <laughs> and I said, I need you. Come quick, I felt like Batman, come quick. Me, Charles, and Natalie are in the women's bathroom of this establishment. Being loud enough so that no women would come in there with us. And Charles takes a needle and thread, and while I was standing on the sidelines, begins to mend Natalie into the dress. Now watch. I'm sitting there and all I could do was cheer for him. 
encourage him. Tell Natalie it was going to be okay, but he was a mending man. I literally watched another man put his hands close to my wife's butt. And I didn't care. Because it was fixing something that I broke. Now watch, now watch, now watch, now watch. I have pictures of it. Natalie's joy began to come back. We're in this bathroom and I'm watching my brother do something that he never probably intended to do to his pastor. <laughs> Mint her into this dress. And I'm looking at him do this and Natalie, look at her face over there on the side. She's crying. She's like, uh, thank you. And she looks good in that dress. But watch this, watch this, watch this, watch this. We get it to the red carpet. And everybody is taking pictures of me and Natalie. Everybody's seeing it. They did not know that 10 minutes earlier, what was completely damaged and exposing. What would have kept her off of the place she was supposed to be. Until she had a man, man that knew how to mend, she would have been exposed. And I dare say that there are too many children and women that are exposed because men have not committed to learning how to mend. The one thing that... Um, I know about Charles and the one thing that I know about men who mend is on the red carpet, nobody was thanking Charles. Nobody was clapping for him. Nobody even knew except me and Natalie. Sometimes men who mend don't get mentioned. It won't be about the credit on this next one, guys. It'll be about the outcome. The outcome was she was on the red carpet confident. It's not until months later when I'm being vulnerable that the man who mended gets mentioned. You're going to have to lead and they may not applaud. You're going to have to go first and they may still talk back. But it's about the outcome, not the recognition. Today, if you're a man in this room or you're watching online, and you know that you want to be a man who is taught by God how to mend. And you need to mend your relationship with him, or you, need to, you know you need to mend a relationship with somebody else, or you know you're called to mend relationships between God and other people. I wanna ask you to do something huge. I want you to come to this altar right now. I want you to take a step of faith and I want you to come. I don't care who you are, how much money you make. Oh, ladies, you should be clapping and shouting. I wanna pray for you. Come on, as they're coming, come on. Let's, come on. We tear them down all the time. We tell them they ain't nothing all the time. But let's thank God right now for men who are deciding to mend. I feel the presence of God. Fellas, as more are coming, I see you. I see you and more than I see you, God sees you. He knows what we've been through. He knows how we've had to try to white knuckle our way. I need women to be praying right now. I, he knows the abuse that happened. He knows the things we've never said to nobody. I'm looking in your eyes. There's stuff we ain't told nobody. He knows the perversion that's in there. The years, the months. He knows, he knows our body count. Come on, our wife might not. He knows all of it. And yet he still looks at you and says, son, Mighty man of God, 
man after my own heart. Who, me? Yes, you. Today, man, I don't want us to come to this altar in pride. But one thing God cannot refuse is a broken and contrite heart. I don't care how many guns you have. I don't care how much money in your bank. You cannot protect your heart without God. What happens when men mend? We all win. Oh, God, y'all didn't even hear me. When men mend, everybody wins. Well, I don't got to prove myself to nobody, but I can walk in meekness. And make the decisions that are going to benefit me. When I can control my body. When I can walk in purity. When I can give as much time to my faith as I do fantasy football. I'm talking about real stuff, y'all. Everything in here depends on where we stand. Many of our ladies are doing too much work. Because we've abdicated our role. If you want to be the man, then be the man. She can't. She wasn't fashioned to. It's built in your DNA to provide. That's why the enemy has come against your confidence. I can't leave no business. I can't. Yes, you can. Yes, you can do everything God's called you to do. Well, how do I know if it's God? How do my kids know it's me? They spend time with me. The only way you know his voice is by being with him while he's speaking. How do I know his voice? By his word. Some of us need to commit to just reading the Bible. Figure out how I get his word hidden in my heart. Some of us are dealing with same-sex attractions. Yes, I said it. But that abuse that happened to you or that feeling or that urge that was, that was affirmed by somebody because you weren't protected. God's not scared of that. He's right here with you in it. And neither are we. Today as a church, we're going to pray for men. And I'm believing, yeah, I stopped the whole sermon series just to talk to y'all. And there's probably another 500 brothers attached to each one of y'all that should have been here. We share clips with our boys, highlights with our boys. But when do we start sharing healing? If every man at this altar would, would you just lift your hands? It's a sign of surrender. And could everybody else stand up and just stretch your hands this way? Mm. Father God, I've spoken with the authority you've given me today as a man who is committed to mending. Today for every man that's young and old, white and black, generation to generation, watching online or in the room, God, I, I'm asking you to do heart surgery on us. Father, do what no narcotic could do. Do what no sex could do. Do, Father, what no amount of money could do. Could you please mend our hearts? Could you please, Father God, return the sons back to their father? Father, would you do us even like the prodigal, Father God? Would you, would you please accept us even though we've been in the pig's pen, God? Many of us mentally, emotionally, spiritually, we've been out away from you. But God, today we repent. And all that means is we turn back to you. And thank you for your grace and your mercy who's been looking for us the whole time. God, today I thank you that I am talking to mended men. Father, I thank you that you will you'll heal the deep places, the anger, the rage, the hurt, the frustration, the pain, the pornography, God, the passivity, Father, the insecurity, God, the abandonment. I got to camp out right there. I pray against the orphan spirit over every man of God. The men who felt like they did not have protection, they were exposed too early. Father, that they didn't have anybody that was actually looking out for them. Father, you are not like our earthly fathers. Father, you're better than, even if we had a good father, you're better than our earthly fathers. And today, Father God, for every 
man that has felt like they've been abandoned and it's been them against the world. Thank you, Father, that they would know that you are for them. <laughs> you are with them. And you won't leave them or forsake you. Father, help us to acknowledge you in all of our ways. And God, we will obey when you direct our path. Thank you that mended men will rise up all over the world. Thank you that we will take our place in the house of God. And God, today as men, maybe for the first time, we are going to praise you for the work that is already starting in our lives. If every man in this place could lift your voice, clap your hands, and give God praise, why don't we all join with them? Hallelujah! Enemy, the devil is scared of a praising man. The devil is scared of a man that takes his authority. God, we honor you. I'm telling you, men of God, you're about to get your voice back. Oh, I felt that thing. You're about to get your voice back. You're not going to have to say much, but what you do say will have authority. You're going to have dominion. Every man in here say, I got dominion. No, say it like you mean it. Don't let the enemy ever lie to you again. You are not a product of your circumstance. You affect your circumstance. This week, God's going to give you instruction. Don't play like he not speaking to you. Oh, man, that must have been the Taco Bell I ate. Taco Bell will tell you a couple things. But it won't tell you to write a letter. Some of you need to write a letter. Some of you need to apologize to people that was back in college. And you don't need a response from them. You need to get it out of you. Some of you, there's a hard conversation you need to have with your wife. It's real quiet at that point. Well, what if everything messes up? God would rather take your broken pieces and put it back together than try to act like it's not broken. I believe in you. Every man under the sound of my voice, you need community. I just feel alone because you decide to be. You're going to walk past all these men to get out of here today. And you just going, oh, you know, we all had people crying up here. This is the time. What's up, bro, man? Nice to meet you. What's your name, bro? Bro, where are you from? Be regular. Stop being weird. We're not in competition with each other. We complete each other. If all of us right here just supported each other, we wouldn't need nobody else's business. And, oh, God. If you would just... And the beautiful thing about this is every ethnicity, every age group, God has made this place a place where men can take their rightful place. But we don't lead with our fists or our words. We lead with our actions. Look at the way that I. So you may have to start being disciplined. You want your wife to start working out? You start working out. No, I'm not the one that needed. She needed you. I'm going to have to do, we're going to have to get together and do a whole situation. You're the leader. Work out for three months and don't say nothing. I moved my gym to my garage to lead my family. I needed her to see me sweat and not say nothing. I come in there, hoo, hoo, hoo. hey, babe, what you doing? Making a sandwich. You want one? No, just trying to keep the, keep the bread down. <laughs> and then one day, she said, I'm, I'm going to come out there with you. It's in their DNA. Don't leave with your talk. Leave with your, stop buying all that. You start saving. You know she's going to keep spending Keep saving. <laughs> you know, like, do, do what you know. Don't blame. Prepare. <laughs> you know Christmas is coming up. You lead. Men of God without women, lead. You ain't got no money for a down payment. But you dripped out. 
Lead now. Hide scriptures in your heart that you're going to tell your kids one day. Start being a man who worships. There shouldn't just be teenagers and, and, and women at the altar. I'm talking about Sunday morning. The men is at the front like, where are we at? What song we singing today? Wait on the Lord. I like that one. I mean, bring your swag to it. It don't got to be weak. It just got to be meek. I feel something. What would happen if every church, every gym, every auto parts store, every business had men of God that were on assignment from the king to take up their space and dominion? In arts and entertainment, in the barbering industry, in movies, in music, in government, what if, and then we all came together to worship on Sundays? And worship the God who gave us the M's and gave us the property and restored us back to our relationships with our brothers, sons, fathers. It's going to be a revolution. Men did men. If you're in this room, whether you're a woman or a man, at the altar or watching at home and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, today I want to give you that opportunity. Nobody leaving, nobody moving. We'll be home in five minutes. Or we'll be leaving to go home in five minutes. But this is the most important part of the service. You can mend your relationship with God right now. Right now. The chasm has been there. And God's saying, yo, this is the easiest part right here. By faith, you can mend one of those three right now. If you're in this room and you've been doing stuff your own way, been going your own direction, and you need to say, God, I want to make it right with you. I want to mend. I want you to put me back together again spiritually. All you have to do on the count of three is lift your hand and we're going to say a prayer together. And I don't want pride to keep anybody watching or in this room from making this decision. Some of y'all need to rededicate your life. Today is the day that everything changes. I'm drawing a line in the sand. I will not be the same man I was before I came in here. Today's your day one. You're making the greatest decision of your life. Two, it took me from being a liar, pornography addict, from somebody who was a manipulator and bad. It didn't make me perfect, but it made me progress. And your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life with faith all over the world. Three, just lift your hand. Man or woman, I see you, my brother. I see you. I see you, my sister. I see you. Oh, come on, y'all. I see you. I see you. I see you. Greatest decision you could ever make. I see you. But more than me seeing you, God sees you. Hey, we're a family at Transformation Church. Everybody lift your hands and let's just pray this together. Say, God, thank you for sending Jesus to mend our relationship. Today, I give you my life. I believe you lived, you died, and you rose again with all power. Change me, renew me, mend me, transform me. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to the kingdom. Oh, come on, y'all. Let's celebrate. We were just mended back to him. Hey, listen. Every man up here, everybody that made that decision, there's a QR code on the screen that's going to come up. I want you to text it. We want to give you some steps. Men of God, I need you in this church. I need you helping me serve. I need you, I need, listen, we can't do this without you. I'm not perfect, neither am I. But I need, as long as you're breathing <laughs> and you're dedicated to moving forward, we got too many more men to go reach. We need you. So let's make a decision this week that we are going to be men that show up in the house of God. And not just come and sneak in. We're going to show up. Those kids up there, they need us. And this is a new day for us. Amen? Amen. I love you. Um, I just feel like every man, y'all hug somebody. <laughs> just, I know this is weird, but man up and hug somebody, man. Ladies, y'all should be clapping for this right here. Hey, if you need prayer for anything, our altar team's coming up. I need y'all to share this video with everybody. If you love a man, 
If you know a man, if you want a man. Now, ladies, there's some single men up here. You need to take your cell phone out and start snapping and go home and just start praying. Put them on your prayer wall. I love you. Until next week, y'all go out and live a transformed life. I love y'all so much. Love you, man. Thank you so much for watching this message. We pray that it encouraged you. Here at Transformation Church, our vision is to represent God to the lost and the found for transformation in Christ. And if you would like to partner with us in giving, you can text GIVE to 828282, or you can visit on our website. Also, be sure to subscribe and check out all the other incredible sermons available, as well as watching our live Sunday experience that begins at 1045 a.m. Central Standard Time. Now, go out and live a transformed life.